I say, hello, Tony. Welcome to our Zoom chat. We try to talk about, you know, a bit about your biography, about your pictures and your new projects. Great. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it, Andre. Uh, Tony, um, as I remember, um, uh, we met about 10 years, well, oh my goodness, it's 10 years ago, uh, 10 years ago uh, for the opening of the Leica store at GUM. And in those days, you still were quite heavily involved with uh, um, uh, jobs in and about Russia, right? Uh, yes, I was also working quite a bit in the United States at that point, right? Yeah. So you started your career, I saw, at some very well-renowned uh, newspapers, right? I remember something with the glo uh, Globe, etc. Uh, yes, it's a, yeah. I started in Chicago. That was my first job. Was at the Chicago Sun Times, which is at that time was one of the largest newspapers in the United States. And and so I came out of RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology, and I did an internship at the Chicago Sun Times, and then that turned into a full time job. Yeah. So, and, so you uh, were sent out to cover uh, every everything which was necessary to cover. Yes. Yes, I did. You know. Uh, and it was, you know, Chicago is a very active city. And, and uh, so there was a lot of, you know, whether it was fires or, you know, bake sales or puppy dog shows or whatever, it was anything that would, you know, sort of very much on assignment kind of uh, photography. So and that was quite. And, and from Chicago, you went on then to? I went on to the Denver Post. That was. Um, uh, At the climate there. <laughs> I, well, I was offered a very, very good position, and they yeah. gave me really special hours, and they uh, allowed me to work more specifically for the magazine, and uh, I was given a lot of freedom to do more of my stories, and there I worked under a really great director by the name of Rich Clarkson, who uh, had had several photographers who had won Pulitzers and had won various awards and so he had, a, he had a great reputation. We started on the same day at the Denver Post. It was a complete disaster. <laughs> when we started the newspaper, it was quite funny. We went out the first night and got drunk together and, and commiserated, you know, but... In those days. <laughs> but we had a great time and uh, he really built one of the most beautiful dark rooms and facilities that existed anywhere, I think, in the United States at that time. He brought in great photographers uh, many who are now at the National Geographic. Mm -hmm. And um, he really taught me how to um, pursue my own ideas and my own work and really not wait for the newspaper to hand me a slip of paper and say, go photograph this, really to think about what it is that you want to photograph and then pursue it and um, really think about what you're, how you're working in a very different way. And that really really took hold with me. I, I really appreciated that idea. And I think that I probably took it as far as anyone could take it. And that obviously spun off as I became a freelancer. I really took control of what it is that I wanted to work on and photograph. So um, in those days, um, what was your favorite gear for shooting? Uh, you know, I didn't have like is it at the time. Uh, it, I was uh, the, the the company gave you the equipment. I think there were Nikon's back then. Well, that was a classical. Uh, yeah, it was classic. Uh, You're talking about F3, way, way F4, back in the eighties. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, so and from there, then you, um, as far as I remember, you went on to Time Magazine. Uh, no, well, not oh. exactly. Okay. What what happened was that uh, from there, I uh, I won a Pulitzer. Uh, at the Denver Post, and oh. um, and it was uh, I I had very good relationship with the management there, the editor in chief and the director, and and I proposed to them to I had seen that there was a famine in Ethiopia that was brewing, and so I proposed to them. It was and they were very supportive. They were ready to send me there, even though it had nothing to do with Denver or the Denver Post, and. Um, um, so by the time I was ready to go, I had all my injections and mm -hmm. all my connections in Ethiopia to go there. Um, they just called me and said, look, we just can't support it. We don't have a real reason. And so I actually took all the money that I had in my bank account and, and I just went on my own. And uh, 
I had really never traveled outside of the United States and so to land in yeah. Ethiopia, which at that time was a very communist country backed yeah. by the Soviet uh, Union. Yeah. And uh, there was civil war going on and there was famine. And so I really landed well, that in That was public. your first real, you know, journalistic, whatever, photographic experience outside of the US. It was the first time I personally traveled outside of the United oh. States ever. <laughs> and Even Europe, I <laughs> went to Europe. And uh, right into Ethiopia. Do you still have, right. have pictures from those days? Probably oh, yes. I'm sorry? Do you still have pictures? Do we have pictures from yeah. those days? Uh, yeah. Um, this is one of the pictures that won the, uh, the Pulitzer. Let's see if I can find it here. on. The... You see there? Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Yeah, this was, this was uh, I stayed two weeks. I uh, was able to, to, um, uh, to work just a few days, the, the situation yeah. was very complex and it was I just, so. you know, I only had a few days of work yeah. and thank God I was with some really good people. They, they really helped me and, uh, mm -hmm. and the Denver Post were never really, they published it, but it was during a big snowstorm. Nobody saw it and uh, the paper never really got delivered, but they took the work and they applied for a, a, a Pulitzer Prize and, uh, mm -hmm. um, I was on my way to New York to possibly go freelance when I heard from the director said, well, I understand you're second okay. for the Pulitzer. You're going to be runner up, but it's going to the committee and they can change that. Mm -hmm. So call me from Chicago when you get in Chicago. And then I was going on to New York. So I, the next day I was in Chicago, I was all alone. I called him and he says, they flipped it. You won. You, you won the Pulitzer. <laughs> that, that, yeah, that's a little bit like a knighthood, right? Uh, a what? It's a little bit like a knighthood. <laughs> uh, very much so. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, something you know that will live you with you for the rest of your life. Absolutely. And so the apartment filled up, and it, it just. Um, and then I went on to New York and became freelance. And there, I connected with um, both some some people at Magnum, um, uh, Philip Jones Griffiths and Gilles Perez, and uh, Howard Chapnick at Black Star. And um, I decided to go with Black Star instead of Magnum at that time. Uh, I don't know if that was the right decision <laughs> many years later or the wrong decision, but... Um, later on, you'll never know. <laughs> the, the man who ran the place, Howard Chapman, he was classic. He was one of the most, probably the most amazing person I've ever worked with. Mm. He really helped me. Um, he was an older gentleman from Hungary mm. and... Uh, he was just very fatherly, very, he really took care of me. He, he was really passionate about my photography and my work. And, uh, and at the same time, Rich Clarkson, the, the man who was the director of photography at the Denver Post, moved to uh, the director of photography at National Geographic, the same uh -huh. time I left. So uh, Howard and, uh, and Rich were good friends, and we connected, and, and I got assignment, uh, first assignment for National Geographic um, to go back to Eritrea and Ethiopia to cover that uh, war for the National Geographic. So you got back again with a bit of a different topic because National Geographic had a bit, a bit of a different view of the world. Yeah, a little bit broader. And, and it, you know, I was able to spend months, three, four, five months on the story and really cover it seriously. Um, Hmm. In a way that, uh, so, you know, that graphic does that kind of thing. And, and uh, from this National Geographic, some some pictures somewhere on your screen? Um, I don't think I have anything from that National Geographic. Then day. let's move directly into end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, in the collapse of the um, Iron Curtain, because I think that was a very, a, a very uh, special time for your work. Uh, absolutely, yeah. I ha I had been working in uh, Philippines and then South Korea during their revolutions, and uh, um, there I won the in South Korea I won the first my first world press photo of the year, um, and uh, that kind of gave me. And I was working with magazines at that time like Stern and Get German Geo and and Time and Newsweek and freelancing with Black Star and doing a lot of different work. And um, and then this then the thing happened in Eastern Europe and and uh, I had moved to Paris uh, 
in the late 80s. Uh, that was a classic career for an American photographer in those days. <laughs> yes, seems to be. There were a few of us there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it allowed me to really travel around Europe and Africa and, and uh, very easily and very quickly, much easier than from the States. So um, all of a sudden, the Berlin Wall collapsed. And nobody expected uh, it. No, well, I mean, there were, there were rumors, you know, I mean, I had friends that were working in there and, and, and telling me, look, there's something happening here. It's, it looks like they, something can move. And you no know, one could imagine that the wall would actually come down. But um, I, I was in. I had uh, seen one of the pictures, uh, which I found in, in your library, uh, that was the one uh, with the flags. I don't know if you remember that one. Uh, 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 yes, because yes, that's, I'm, trying, I'm trying to find the... A lot of your work is in black and white, but this was definitely in color. Yes, and, and all of my work really up to that point was in color. Uh, I, I really didn't start working in black and white till around the time of the, the Berlin Wall. Oh, you so. didn't, so that was basically early work. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and the first Leica that I bought um, was after I moved to New York and went freelance. The Geographic had a special uh, uh, deal for some M6s, and I bought two of them. And I had never used a Leica before, and I really didn't know how to use a Leica. I didn't even have an idea. And um, but I took it out on assignment, and I just started playing with it. And I was and I was putting black and white in that camera. And let me see if I can see this is one of the yeah this is probably one of the first black and white pictures that I ever took with a Leica. Mm -hmm. That was in uh, Armero, Colombia, when there was this d volcano that exploded and 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 this mudslide came down and covered this town and killed a lot of people. And that that um, was one of the first, if not the first, real time that I started to use the the M6 and play with it. And I realized I was not good with it uh, at uh, first. M6 or R6? M6. M6. Oh, so you went for the rangefinder? Yes. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Because uh, usually got... when you came from an icon, you would have gone to an R system, and to an SLR. It I like, you know, I always <laughs> love the book, uh, of photographers who use that rangefinder. And um, okay. for me, it, I, I, I always felt that it, it it had the the look that I liked. It it gave me it gave me the feel of the way I saw things in the world and and it was a it took me a while to to really be able to use that like in a way that I felt that I was um, capturing what I saw and the, and the more and more that I used it the better I became with it and then the Nikon's and the Canons basically fell away because they just didn't have the spirit or the or the quality of life that I felt that I was able to capture. Like I really mm -hmm. became one with the camera. At one point, you really feel like this is your eye, this camera. You mean the extension of the eye that suddenly you just, um, a camera, a, a man, machine, and man uh, are, are completely one? Totally. Huh. You really feel like gonna... the, the 6 and the uh, 28 or 35 that you were yeah. really able to see the world in the way that you see it and capture it the way that you see it. And, and it, it, and that evolved and it evolved quickly, but it evolved over some years to a point where I just really didn't want to have anything to do with the DLSR, you know, with a uh, reflex camera because it just wasn't giving me the vision of the world that I, that I was. Seeing, so, you know? so you were there at end of 89, beginning of nineties in the, uh, the toppling of the Berlin wall. Um, and from there on, what were, were your next assignments? Yeah, so I I immediately jumped on that. I mean, I'm just I mean, just amazing because I was sitting in Paris when the wall fell that night, and I got called by Howard Chapnick at Black Star here in New York, and he said, "Tony, you know, go quickly." And I huh. and I, I had yeah. a lot of things going on. He said, "Okay, you do what you want, but this is probably the biggest story of your life." <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> You do what you want. So I got on a plane at five o'clock, I think, the next morning and was in Berlin. I'd never been there. Uh, I took a hotel right near Checkpoint Charlie, yeah. and I just started walking around and photographing, and it was literally all happening right in front of me. There were a lot of photographers coming in, but 
It was so emotional. It was really, really a powerful um, uh, moment. And then from there, I started to, you know, because as American, it was very difficult to visit those countries in those days, but they started to open one by one. Romania, probably, um, I went to the Czech Republic for their revolution, then I went to Romania when Ceausescu fell. Okay. But Romania seemed really unique, and Romania seemed like it was lost in the past, and um, it had not progressed for 40 or 50 years. So I kept returning to Romania. I had good connections. I, 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 I saw in your portfolio quite quite some pictures uh, from, from Romania where uh, looked into certain social situations. Do you have something to show? Uh, uh, yes, I do. I can bring up here. Uh, this is this was Romania, okay, yeah. and uh, I, I had a, a young friend, and we just uh, traveled around the country. He had a, a, a book of, uh, uh, that had roadmaps that uh, nobody knew, and only was military had access to. And so we um, yeah. uh, were just traveling with that book and going on all these back roads, and we would run into these amazing scenes. This, this actually, I sh photograph I shot on assignment for Stern magazine with a Stern um, uh, writer, uh, Klaus Lutterbeck, and um, and uh, it was just very ancient. And it, this was really a perfect um, thing. I love just going for two weeks there and traveling around uh, with the Leica and. Um, and, and, and photographing the life there. And I, I spent probably two or three years working there and covering these, uh, going into all these little remote areas and we would eat by going to weddings or funerals, you know. <laughs> there was no other way really, so we're always looking for a wedding or a funeral so we could find food. And people always welcomed us in the villages and uh, it was really, a, um, a kind of charming, beautiful experience to live through. But then I started to work in Russia. And um, that was so uh, 93, 94, right? 91. 91 already, okay. It's amazing because I got a visa to Moscow in June of 91, and I was going to go in August. And literally the day I was going to get on the plane, the coup d'etat happened. Hmm. And they held Gorbachev in the Kremlin. And Yeltsin was on the tank in front of, and I, and I literally got on the plane, and this was all happening, and I remember coming in at night, my first time I arrived in Moscow, and we were, the taxi was going through this column of tanks <laughs> going into the city, and, you know, it just went from there. It was really, uh, all of a sudden, I was in the middle of this huge story. And for you, as a journalist in these kind of situations, um, did did you encounter fear or was it always more like my like excitement? Oh, it's scary. Yeah, there's no okay. question about it. It's scary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you yeah. you uh, in those days I would, you know, see those stories and, and that's what I did for time and Newsweek and National Geographic and different and Stern magazine. I was doing a lot for Stern mm -hmm. or Perry Match or London Sunday Times, all these different magazines I was working with and um uh, you know, you'd run and you'd go there and then you realize, well, what was I thinking? You know, why, why did I put myself in this position? This is really crazy, you know. Do and, you, uh, for, yeah, for your, your first uh, encounters in Russia, do you have some pictures which you, would, which you could show? Yeah, that's the cover of the book that I did some years later. That's from the Kremlin in, yep. in the early 90s. Looks different now. Um, it looks entirely different now. <laughs> Uh -huh. That was Russia, of course, right after the fall of the wall. That was in yeah. 91, fall of the, um, uh, mm -hmm. and so I, I, you know, it was amazing because I, I did the, I was covering this revolution and I had a really nice, uh, photographs from this revolution that time published very big. And, and then I got a call from, I think, ABC television. They said, look, we have a special, uh, interview with Gorbachev and Krem and, uh, and Yeltsin in the Kremlin, and we want you to be the photographer. Hmm. So I had been there maybe three, four days, and I was being ushered into the Kremlin. And within you know a few hours, I was shaking hands with Mikhail Gorbachev and Boris Yeltsin. And I thought, well, I can work here. This is a, this is a great place to work, you know. And so I stayed. I stayed for ten years working there. And, yeah, and uh, yeah. 
So yeah. you also covered this kind of, let's say, social revolution which happened in the in the post-Soviet society. I remember something like uh, Moscow Nights or whatever it was called. Um, these kind of uh, what happens when um, a society completely changes. Absolutely, absolutely, and that's what I was trying to photograph. It was uh, it was a great situation because I had a contract with Time Magazine at that point, and they I was their basically main photographer in Russia, and um, so, and I had an apartment in Moscow, and I was going back and forth from Paris to Moscow, and I'd spend a lot of time there. I really ended up having a lot of friends and doing a lot of wonderful work there, and. Um, but I really wanted to create a document that um, sort of embraced that whole idea of transition. And I could like pinpoint out certain stories, whether it was violence and business and, you know, the, the war in uh, Chechnya and Grozny and these things. And then in the end, after 10 years, I brought them all together and created a book and uh, Beyond the Fall, which uh, I think it was published in four or five different countries. We had an exhibition in Moscow in New York, in Berlin, um, and in London at the Royal Festival Hall. So it was a huge, it really was, uh, ended up being a huge um, success. And still today in Moscow. So, so you still um, have friends there because obviously you live there quite some time. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. There, there, there are people that, that, that I... Um, that was like, uh, when, when you go there, that was Krasnodar. That's Krasnodar right yeah. there, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is from Chechenia. Yeah. Uh, this is from Grozny. These pictures, that, that won me the um, Robert Kapp Award. Yeah. Lisa yeah. Gross. So, uh, yeah, that was also the picture. I, I picked uh, this view in the totally devastated city. Yeah, that's the, the if, in the back behind that guy is the parliament, and there, there were snipers all around. It was a really, really scary picture to make that photograph. I, I, it was amazing they didn't kill him. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, uh, this is in then in Sahumi, in uh, in Abkhazia. I went in and I covered that. Um, Formerly a Republic of Georgia. <laughs> from the Republic of Georgia, that yeah. uprising. And then I returned, and the, the, the night that I came back from Georgia, the whole streets of Moscow were on fire, and um, there was this kind of tried to, this was, I remember I shot this with the M6, mm. and uh, the next morning I got up, I just took my M6, I walked to the time office, and I ended up So usually the 35 things. or the 28? This will be the 28. I think that the 28 was my primary lens for quite some time. The funny thing is, I had one photo talk with Ralph Gibson, and he said, you should only use the 50 millimeter. <laughs> I know. I saw that. Um, but today, I only use the, uh, the 35 now is my primary. Uh, okay. Yeah. So when you, when you look back into uh, those long experiences in Russia, what, what were the key points you did take home, whatever, wherever your home is? <laughs> um. It was it was interesting time watching this transformation from this communist sort of corrupt communist society to kind of corrupt capitalism capitalistic society and um, and uh, you know the, but there were certain things about the people there that were different because of how they were brought up they weren't brought up under capitalism they didn't understand how to make money they didn't understand how you do photography and make money. Mm. I met a lot of photographers. How do you make a living into photography? I mean, it was really elusive to them. And, but they had other qualities, you know, that we hadn't there. Their, their riches were in their friends and the books they read and their education and their background. And so yeah. that was something that for me, I took away. I really, really appreciated that, so that aspect means that the, I see the, that. The we, experience of the people were the really moving part, the interesting part. No question about it. And, and okay. the social interaction was always so intense you know you either love the place or you hate the place and yeah. sometimes sometimes you could do both at the same time <laughs> okay that sounds definitely like russia <laughs> so <laughs> russia. so um and then at a certain time you had this feeling i have to go back and i th remember this it was uh, we had this uh, you had the project with a few photographers facing change yes and i and i think that uh you know, the, the, uh, when I did come back to, I moved back into the United States 
in 2000 and late 2007, 2008. Yeah. And, right uh, around the financial and, crisis. And we have this big economic uh, collapse, the, the banks with the mortgage loans and all this stuff. You know, at my office, I have this picture, the, the, this guy in front of Wall Street you took. Right, right. Did you have uh, it on your screen? I have it somewhere. Let me just see if I can uh, pull it up. Um, might be able to... Because it's very, yeah, yeah, that's the one. It's very complicated to, to, to shoot a picture of Wall Street. Yeah. Yes. Because uh, the street is so dense. And you captured this guy in front of it, raising his arms as if he would say, oh, God, <laughs> send down some whatever. <laughs> I, I completely. And yeah. uh, this Really, at the time where the Wall Street was collapsing, this was sometime I think in September of 2008. I started working on that story in March of 2008. I went into Cleveland, and what I saw was devastating. I brought the pictures back to Time Magazine. They were they were just amazed at the pictures. They 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 didn't I couldn't imagine that that what I was seeing. This is one of my favorite ones. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah let me see. I, I think that was that also the one the one. Uh, uh, who uh, was a World Press Award at a certain time? Yeah, yes, that this one. Is, this is the second World Press Photo of the Year, yeah, exactly uh, that I that I won. This was in Cleveland in uh, 2008 with an officer going in and foreclosing on a home at gunpoint. Yeah. It was it was very frightening. We went into a lot of homes. He took me with him for the day, and you know he he we didn't know what was inside. Sometimes people could be there with weapons. Yeah, and, yeah. I mean it was really dangerous, and and um, and he was. You know, he let me go right with him there for yeah. the day and, and really photograph him at close range. But it gave you the the seriousness of the situation and, yeah. and, and how intense it was. So and uh, then you it, came up with a few photographs with this idea of facing change to, to document this, what's happening uh, yes, through the financial yeah. crisis. Yeah, that, that really came as a result of, I, I think, that, that World Press photo uh, and, yeah. and the... the, the those photographs were published everywhere. That, I mean, it was just massive, uh, the publications of those photographs that I had. And um, so I, came, I, I gathered a group of photographers and, and uh, created an organization. Again, you know, I really realized at that point that photography was coming into a new era because yeah. not only was digital and all this yeah. uh, coming into light, but also magazines were not sending people out. They were not financing people in the way yeah. that they can make a living. And so I said, well, you know, let's create our own organization and find a way to um, <clears throat> help photographers go out and do this work and create this work. And we, we, we established a relationship with the Library of Congress. We established a relationship with a National Geographic magazine, with German Geo, with... Um, uh, 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 Liberation in France and and uh, some Italian magazines and Russia. So we had this amazing, and of course with Leica, and Leica became uh, one of the major um, supporters. We did of that sponsor this at this time, yeah. Uh, you were the uh, you were one of the main uh, people that come in and, and help that organization get off the ground and and, and get going. <clears throat> but then, it, as the British say, something happened on the way to the forum. Yes, well, it's. I think if you look at any startup, there's always issues as yeah. as within the first years. You have to, you know, those those can be very testy, and and and. Um, I think there were people that wanted to take the organization in in, in different directions and things, mm -hmm. and, um, and I became involved with another project that sort of started taking my attention, which was, um, which became a film project, and uh, <clears throat> uh, which was. I uh, get involved with uh, the farming and, and the agricultural sector That's, here. In the I, I come to this project, the Organic Rising Project. Right. But that means at a certain time, you also went into more what people might call video, film, cinema. To totally. Uh, totally immersed. <clears throat> I mean, I think the first... Uh, two or three years that I worked on Organic Rising, I was still doing quite a bit of still photography. And I had a kind of problem to know when can I, should I do video and when should I do stills? And I think I was putting a lot of effort on the stills that I, I you know, 
But as the, the project progressed, and um, again, Leica was one of the, the initial supporters of that project, and um, uh, then we hosted an Indiegogo, uh, no, uh, 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 yeah, Indiegogo campaign, mm. and we had all these people that came in, and maybe six or seven hundred people who, you know, wanted to finance the actual film. So we really Which turned. It was a sort of pre-Kickstarter project. It was exactly, and it was a Kickstarter Indiegogo. It's just, so we were very successful. But more than getting the funding, we got so many connections of people in the industry, people, I mean, in, in the agricultural industry and in the, and, in the film industry, who both came at me. And I was able to connect with a, a great organization, Goldcrest Films, which is a British uh, big film company mm -hmm. here in New York. Um, uh, Nick Quest did, and he, he became interested in the film. And then we... I started being contacted by CEOs of like Nature's Path and some of the bigger organic companies who wanted me to come film their operations and wanted when, to be when part exactly of the film. When exactly did this project start? 14 or 15? Uh, 2000 and, uh, 2012. 12 it's been, oh my God. It's eight years of work and it just grew exponentially. Every year it just got bigger and bigger and all of a sudden at one point, we had we were editing a ten-hour series, um, initially, on, on various aspects. Because what we found is that we didn't just look at the organic industry; we looked at also the conventional industry that uses all these chemicals and pesticides and yeah. GMO seeds. And I realized how serious that was. That we're you're talking about something that was affecting hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of people around the world. Uh, with these chemicals in our water, in our air, in our food, and what that was doing to us, we interviewed a no I interviewed a number of scientists um, that I was introduced to by journalists, and um, and they really showed me things I couldn't believe what they were telling me. At first, I couldn't believe it was so striking. I said, "Why the the press isn't covering this?" And now. So, Eight years later, a lot of this has come come forward. Yeah, sure. That means, but um, the, uh, how far is the project um, for, uh, for ready for showing? The project we're at we're at the end. We we had to take it down to a feature. Uh, Goldcrest took it to so Netflix a, a, and Hulu a, a nine, and some ninety of these. minutes feature. It's two hours at this point. It's a two hour edit, and um, we've reached out to Jane Goodall to do the the voiceover. We're hoping oh. to have a response from her she's yeah. uh you know uh great and she's involved with the food industry um but a lot of these chemicals now um, the world health organization declared the main uh, glyphosate roundup as a carcinogen and there's now all these lawsuits of course it was yes, exactly yeah. g so you're in, in the Germany. middle also of a discussion and also uh lawsuits etc huge huge lawsuits and this you know i had captured all of this footage years before it became this yeah. uh, huge problem. So now we have embellished all of that into the film. And and, uh, and I think we're all really excited. We are at a place where we basically need to put the animation and graphics in, uh, okay. and, and, the, and the scoring and music uh, on it. And, and, and it's done and it's ready to go. So we're probably about four... I'd say between three and six months of, of releasing the film, and that's okay. you know as always funding dependent. It's just so that's, that would be a pre Christmas uh, launch. Yes, yes, yeah. I, you know, and the people who have seen it have have just said this is you know life changing. This film, it really because we also really look at how philosophically the idea of doing organic really has to do with man's interaction with but, nature um uh, tony when i when i think of that so so you, you probably evolved from just showing reality in trying to show reality to change reality yes yes so and and you're in a political I, you know, that, position now that, that that that's the draw of, of doing a, a film or doing yeah. a documentary opposed to doing still photography is nowadays i think you have these platforms like netflix and some other Mm -hmm. platforms where you can see these kind of um, documentaries they're much more accessible to people you can tell stories with words and pictures and music and you know you can really journalistically 
take control of a subject and really yeah. present your point of view in a way that, you know, you, you know, photography is a limiting too. At the same time, I must say, I, I, I really kind of left photography for three or four years and went Which means, really completely. Which you really work now like a cinematographer? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, would, I would like to say that I do. It's, it, the, the learning curve has been in the, the greatest challenge of my life. I would guess way. so. It's different. Still. How to use the camera as a film camera and, and with gimbals and learning how to work with sound, learning how to work with editing, learning how to work with, uh, you know, images in after effects and you know all these programs and it just takes months to kind of like get your head around them and working with editors and and raising money i mean and and being able to to fundraise all of those things uh are very complicated and all those things revile, re, uh, require a tremendous amount of attention and oversight and and you, you you can't be successful if you're not successful at all of them so um, that's that's been the huge learning curve. I'd like to say that I'm I'm I can I'm a good filmmaker. I, I can't quite. <laughs> I'm not so too, so you, I'm, so I'm, so in between a, a filmmaker, a cinematographer, a still photographer, and a producer. Uh, completely. <laughs> a direct. Uh, a direct a, 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 okay. You're directing this whole, and there's a lot of people involved, and and you're just dealing with so many different um, uh, aspects that. To bring it all together, it's this is an enormous challenge. But that challenge, you hope the big payoff is that you can have something that goes out on the Netflix or or a larger platform. Uh, you know, one of the great things that happened to us after the Indiegogo campaign is that we were able to connect with Deepak Chopra, and he became the executive producer of the film. Mm -hmm. So Deepak, you know, he was great. Uh, you know, he just said, "Listen, Tony, if you want to use my name to go out and and mm -hmm. you know." connect with people to make things happen, use it as freely as you want. I completely agree with your film and what you're doing and back you 100%. So he's been, and he's a wonderful man and he's just been really wonderful with us. And he hopes to use his um, social media platform. I think he has an outreach of about 10 million to promote the film once it comes out. He also wants to connect with Oprah, who's a, uh, Winfrey, who's an organic farmer. And so he's, he's you know, he's, He's a, been a great connection, and it's just like people like that who have who have come in and really supported this project. And um, now we're we're really towards the end of the end of the game, so I'm really excited to get it out there. And, and oh, Tony, and after our recording, we should shortly discuss if we could help again, right, to bring out the movie. <laughs> Would be great, and and uh, you know I I know you uh, we have some great organizations in Great Britain that are working with us now, and. Um, it would be great to have a nice connection in Germany. There's going to be a lot of previews. There's a lot of theaters that want to host it. We're going to, you know, film festivals, um, con, you know, all these. Uh, okay. So well, let's do this later outside of a <laughs> so, um, question. Um, uh, but, you know, the amazing thing, the amazing thing, Andre, yeah. is that after all these years and here I am at the end of this film. And honestly, I'm on it every day. It yeah. really consumes me. All of a sudden, we have this coronavirus hit New York and, and the world, but we became the epicenter. And I'm, so I'm sitting here, and now we have this huge racial uh, uprising that's really hitting New York. And uh, I have to get out. I have to go and photograph these things. You know, and, you started again. And so I, instead of picking up a film camera, I mean, a, a video camera, I picked up yeah. a steel camera. I picked up my Leica. And so this is how I'm going to photograph. Uh, do you have a monochrome? No, I'm I'm using the uh, my favorite is the M with the with the 35. Yeah. One. But but the monochrome would be the M with the with the black and white sensor. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we should, I, we should I, get I, you I one. This. Maybe we should send you one. <laughs> this is, and I can do video with this camera, which is and I have done a lot of organic rising was shot on this uh, camera. So that's the M240. Yes. Yep. Okay. It's a, it, this is, this is a dream camera for me. It's a really, the color. I think that, the, you know, a couple of things I would just say, like, and when you gave me that 35, mm. you said to me, look, Tony, this is not like the 35 for the film. This is sharper because you need that for digital. There's nothing like this lens. This lens is in, in, in a league of its own. 
It, okay. No Canon, no no other lens yeah. can touch this lens. It's the sharpest lens that that uh, one can imagine. It's just brilliant. But the sensors for the yeah. Leica and all photographers who have used Leica, they know this. Yeah. The color is very special. And you and you mentioned this to me too one time, that the the color and a Canon or or a Nikon is very Asian or Japanese looking kind of warmish color. The color in a Leica is a, a very kind of European color and you, it's you have always these. what you also want to have in cinema that it's true, let's say, especially to skin tones, which is very complicated. And and, and reds, the reds are kind of like a burgundy and it's I just you know, I, I, I just love it. I, I there's just I can't use another camera because I like that color palette so much and I know other photographers buy those cameras simply to get that color palette mm. because it's so beautiful. Thank God we do something right. <laughs> anyway, so that means you have a new project, uh, New York in the times of the lockdown. I don't know, I, I guess. I just Or New York in the times of a sort of whatever uprising we might call it. In the middle of editing this, uh, finishing this film, I just, I don't know, Andre, I, I go out my door and I'm in the, in the store, you know, you, you, I, I, I go to the grocery store, I put my like in my bag and always end up taking pictures. I'm, I always end up seeing something that makes a, a wonderful photograph. So you, you know? can't stop taking pictures, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> the Leica, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I, I'll show you a, a couple of... Uh, Times Square was completely empty, and uh, Times Square completely empty. A plastic bubble, and it just yeah. really uh, gave you the idea of, you know, and again, perfect situation to have a a Leica a camera um, to work with there, and uh, but uh, here, here, and this situation was outside of a a, a movie theater mm -hmm. at night. Uh, and, uh, spooky, this guy, I, yeah? I'm very spooky. You know, I felt yeah. like I was, uh, the whole situation was so beautiful. The, the, the whole city was empty. It was these canyons of these massive architecture. Yeah. And at night as the light would descend, you felt like you were entering into a Robert, uh, Hopper paint, uh, Edward Hopper painting. Yeah. It, yeah. it was, everything was just sort of empty. And there was this little sparse light coming from, uh, Some place with maybe one or two people and so like the famous night hawks. Completely, <laughs> it really, it really. You, I felt like you were living inside of night hawk paint. Oh. You know what? And it, it was so beautiful. Yeah. It was a, one of the most impressive yeah. times in New York City I ever imagined. One day I, I got up at five o'clock in the morning and said, "Okay, I'm going to go out before the sun." And the city was entirely empty. You're the only one on the street, the, the roads, no cars, no people, nothing. I went over the Brooklyn Bridge, mm -hmm. nobody. And the sunrise was coming up. I went into the city and, and drove my bicycle around these canyons that were just, it was uh, out of a movie. It was so surreal. You couldn't believe in the beauty of the light. And because there's no pollution, everything is clean and nature is coming out and it was an apocalyptic feeling. It was That's just a absolutely different New York. <laughs> so, Tony, and, um, that means the next the next weeks via email or WhatsApp, we should discuss how can we do a project for galleries, LFI, etc. Out of this, yeah. I would love to. I, mean, I, <laughs> I, I, I didn't take any of it seriously, you know, Andre. I, I really just would pick up my Leica from time to time and. Say, okay, I need to get out and see some stuff and, and get Tony, on my bike. And Tony, obviously, as a very serious photographer, um, it, I think it can be taken seriously. And, uh, you know, I haven't shown these photographs to anyone. I mean, I, I literally just oh. was doing this on my own. I didn't show them to Geographic or Time or anybody. Because yeah. uh, I'm so involved with the film. Yeah. I, you know, I'm working morning to night on the film. And... Um, I just, you know, there's just not enough hours in the day to do it. <laughs> Honestly, there's so much going on. And, and uh... so, for instance, if we if we restart LA again because the LA store was looted, um, we could do for the it was looted. Yeah, sure, the New York store too. Um, looted? 
Uh, yeah, the the New York uh, Leica store in Soho was was looted. The uh, and the San Francisco store too. Holy cow! Yeah, yeah, sure. But uh, life goes on, and so the the idea could be perhaps when we start LA again, the gallery in in uh, stop in autumn in fall, you might say, uh, maybe we do this. Yeah, my New York in lockdown. Sure, why not? Why not? Yeah, <laughs> or something yeah. like this. <laughs> These photographs, you know that. The, there's a point, you know, everything for me about that situation was you're just living it. It's part, you know, you're, you're breathing it. And, and, and to have the Leica there at my disposal and be able to use it, it's an extension of who I am and my ability to see the world and capture it. And then this big story happening in front of me, just kind of going out and it, you just breathe it. It's, there's no sort of a sense of, oh, we're doing a project or something. Yeah. just like in the middle of life and all of it is just sort of, you know, as I said, you just feel like you don't have enough hours in the day. You, re you really just So that's work. what I said, we should do something there. And I will connect with you again after our chat the next days via email. So let's discuss it, huh? Sure, yeah. absolutely. And maybe we find also a way to do, do something on organic rising because you might not know it. Um, my my brother-in-law is the founder of the biggest organic uh, health store chain in Europe. <laughs> I do know that. I, and I met him at your birthday party. Oh, right. Yeah, okay. And and my so father was at the, this is the oldest company doing uh, organic um, um, cosmetics. Uh, the company is called Velida. So um, we are a little bit um, infected by this. <laughs> yeah, I, I, and you know the ma the amazing thing is during the time of the 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 the, the pa pandemic here, the, yeah. the, the organic food uh, producers just I mean people went crazy for them. Now they can't produce enough food, and and it's everybody's trying to get the organic. Now it's all of a sudden people are understanding that food is health and. It helps your immune system and helps you fight these kind of diseases and viruses and and that the conventional is where they're coming from. That's where these these viruses mutate into. So that you know, there's a real been a real shift in mentality leading up to this, but this was a, like a grand moment of in, in the United States, I and mean, I don't know about Europe, but there's now a this huge uh, well, you know, get... in the in, in the part of Austria where I live, it's uh, the, the the country part is called Salzburg. Um, about sixty percent of the farmers are organic farmers. Holy cow! That's fantastic. <laughs> That's a bit different. <laughs> yeah, it's completely different. Than... I think it's percent or so in the United States, maybe ten. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Tony, so we... um, first. Um, I want to uh, uh, thank you that we were able to uh, discuss this again, see some pictures. Second, I hope that for the next 30 or 40 years, you still have this urgent, uh, urgent feeling. I have to go out and take pictures. <laughs> and, I hope so. <laughs> and uh, maybe we can do some things again because I would love that. That would be great too. I would too. I mean, like it's a great company. You guys have always been so supportive. It's just been endless. So um, I thank you again. And uh, the so, cameras are, are the biggest pleasure. Tony, uh, as we say, um, uh, the, the, the older German photographers, they had a greeting. I say it first in German, it was called gut Licht. That means have great light. <laughs> Yeah, that was how photographers greeted each uh, other. Light. Uh, so in 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 this sense, good licht for the for the for the projects, and we will uh, connect and try to find out what you can do together in the next months and years.